next speaker is uh, Dr. Wayne Jones. If you have a seat, please. Those of you in the back, please sit down. Darn, this includes you. I guess I can't get his attention. Right, Watch out! Dr. Wayne Jones. Dr. Jones is one of the uh, preeminent scientists in the field of uh, forensic al alcohol research. He's published uh, many uh, peer review articles, most of which uh, we are very familiar. Uh, in fact, one of his articles on uh, what we call margin of error is contained in my uh, materials. Uh, Dr. Jones is going to be speaking to us today uh, on uh, various aspects of scientific uh, alcohol testing. And I'd like for you to all please welcome, uh, from Sweden, uh, Dr. Wayne Jones. Thank you very much, and it's nice to be here in California, my favorite state. First of all, I think I have to thank uh, the uh, California DUI Lawyer Association for inviting me to participate in this meeting. Particularly Josh Dale, he was the driving force behind uh, getting me over here. But I also want to thank the president, uh, Ron Jackson, for the introduction, and even the past president, Randy Moore, who I've known for quite a few years. And again, of course, uh, the one and only Vince Tushi, who is a rising uh, star in this business. The title was given to me by Josh, so I try to work around this title. And although my research over the past 30 years has focused uh, extensively on alcohol uh, and uh, DUI. For the last five years I've been re very interested in other drugs than alcohol, <laughs> both illicit drugs and illicit drugs or medication. And uh, the last part of my talk, I'm going to give some information about this because um, in Sweden where I live, we have a zero tolerance law now for uh, scheduled drugs. This is not only illicit drugs like methamphetamine or, or cannabis, but even prescription drugs. If the uh, person has been overdosing or abusing these substances, I mean, abuse of uh, prescription drugs is quite widespread. So this is my, the title that Josh gave me, and uh, I put some uh, material around this title. So if you take too much alcohol or the wrong drug, you can uh, risk getting in trouble with uh, that police car. Uh, as I say, as uh, was mentioned by Ron, I'm from Sweden, but I was born in Wales, which is um, part of Great Britain. There is Wales, so I was born there, but I've been living in Sweden longer than I lived in Wales. So I guess I've got a rather strange um, dialect just now, uh, because I use Swedish language uh, all the day, and testifying in court has to be done in, in Swedish. That's what Sweden looks like. It's about the size of California uh, in area, but it only has 9 million uh, inhabitants. I mean, you've got more people living in LA than you have in Sweden. Those dots, by the way, on the map here. That's where there's an evidential breath alcohol analyzer located. And most of them, as you see, are in this, this vicinity, and this vicinity, and down in the south. And the reason for that you'll see shortly. That's where the major cities are. Stockholm is the capital. Malmö is the big town in the south, with a bridge over to Copenhagen in Denmark, and Gothenburg on the um, West Coast. Have you been to Sweden? Not many. A few. I guess you own a Volvo car anyway, some of you. <laughs> or a Saab as well, you may own. They used to be Swedish cars. They're now owned by Ford and General Motors. But Sweden is a nice, clean country, and if you haven't had a chance, you should really uh, take a visit there. In the north, in the summer, you have the midnight sun, it never gets dark. Unfortunately, there's a lot of mosquitoes up north. So if you're 
allergic to mosquitoes avoid the north of Sweden, at least in the summer. We're interested in um, traffic crashes, what causes traffic crashes. And there are three elements, I think, in every traffic crash. Uh, the first, I think, is the vehicle. I mean, you can uh, have bad steering on your car. Maybe the brakes fail. Or maybe you're driving too fast. You could have, be involved in a crash. The environment is also a, an element in the, the crash. It's raining, snowing, ice on the roads. It can cause the crash. And again, the third element, the one that we're interested in here, is the driver. And what can influence the driver's ability to drive. By the way, uh, on the front cover of my handout, uh, I show these two drugs. This one is, um, anyone knows this one? This is ethanol or beverage alcohol. I wonder how many know what this one is. It's a medicinal drug, which we're seeing now a very great extent of this drug in uh, traffic uh, crashes in Sweden. I'll think about it until the end of the lecture. There may be a prize for the one to get it right. <coughs> So what causes the driver to drive poorly? <coughs> well, I mean, sleep loss, fatigue is a major problem among drivers, long distance truck drivers, for instance. If you're getting on in age, up in your 80s, you can still drive, but uh, you react quite differently compared to when you're in your 20s or 30s. In fertility, various uh, medical conditions can influence your driving ability. An experience, of course, of driving, Novice drivers are obviously at bigger risk in traffic than experienced drivers, and that's why uh, many states have a 0.02 for novice drivers. I can tell you in Sweden, we have a 0.02 for all drivers. So our per se limit in Sweden is 0.02. Obviously, you can't enforce a limit like that using field sobriety tests, because uh, they just aren't sensitive enough. We use PBTs enforce that low limit. Uh, cell phones uh, cause these traffic crashes. There was a review article now that just came out looking at the epidemiology of traffic crashes caused by using a cell phone. But today we want to deal with three other uh, things that uh, can uh, unfortunately impair a, drive, a driver's ability to drive safely. And the one is alcohol, <coughs> illicit drugs, and even medication. And these three together uh, are a, a, a cause of many uh, crashes on our roads. And that's why we have to have legislation to try to prevent people driving under the influence of these things. So driving under the influence then could be caused by alcohol, Ethanol is the primary alcohol, but you can even be impaired by drinking isopropanol. And some people who are on skid row maybe get drunk drinking isopropanol. I wouldn't recommend drinking this alcohol, methanol, that's pretty deadly unless you get into treatment uh, very quickly. Then the drugs we, we're interested in are illicit drugs like methamphetamine, cocaine, the cannabis. Uh, GHB and uh, ecstasy and drugs like that, and also illicit drugs or prescription drugs. And road rage has been said to be caused by people taking anabolic steroids. Uh, some people sniff uh, solvents to get a high. So uh, organic solvents like gasoline, glue, toluene, and acetone, uh, that, they can cause impairment. And we shouldn't forget the hangover or the after effects of uh, alcohol and drug use is that can also cause impairment even if your level in your blood is not measurable. You could be, have, have anxiety or slow reaction time or fatigue caused by your heavy drinking the night before. So enforcement of these laws regarding alcohol and other drugs are either based on chemistry or on behavior, and behavior-based laws look closely at the driving performance of the individual, 
the signs and symptoms of alcohol or drug influence when he's apprehended by the police, and also the uh, so-called field sobriety tests, the one leg stand, the walk and turn, and the gaze and starveness. And in some jurisdictions, the suspect examined by a physician who has to make a judgment on whether the person is under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And for drugs, uh, police officers are trained, so-called DREs. I don't really believe a lot in behavioral testing. My feeling is that you have to use chemistry to test for these substances. You could never, in my opinion, justify convicting someone for a, a DUID or a DUI based on only behavioral evidence. You have to have the chemistry or the toxicology to support that. And that entails starting with a PBT at the roadside, only a presumptive test, of course. Uh, there's a lot of interest now in analyzing drugs besides alcohol in saliva. So the police in the future may have a saliva test to test at the roadside if they suspect the person has been taking illicit drugs. If the roadside test is positive, the next step is the evidential test at the police station. And again, as you know, evidential testing for good or for bad, probably for bad, is being used at the roadside in this state and in other states, and also in Sweden. And finally, uh, if you don't have the breath test, you have to have a sample of blood for analysis of alcohol or drugs. And that is the evidence that I much prefer to see in a DUI or a DUID case. Here's a uh, flowchart of how, how it might work in Sweden. I know it might not work like this in this country or in this state. But in Sweden, uh, the police can conduct random controls of motorists. So either you're a, you, you can commit a traffic violation, speeding, crossing a double uh, yellow line or something like that, uh, or you're a random control, or you're involved in the crash. With that background, uh, the police can ask you to, to blow into a PBT. They don't need any field sobriety evidence. If they have that suspicion, you can be asked to blow the PBT. It's best if you do it. Uh, if it's negative, the PBT, but the officer sees that there are some signs of uh, other drug use, maybe the guy has dilated pupils, which is a sign of perhaps taking stimulants. Maybe he has pinpoint pupils, which is a sign of taking opiates. Or other signs on the driver uh, you can uh, be taken down and asked to give a blood sample or be examined by a DRE in this country. If the roadside test is negative, that is, there's no alcohol in the, in the man's system, then there's no further action. If the test is positive, the PBT, you're taken to the police station and asked to give an evidential test. Uh, if you refuse the evidential test, that doesn't help, really, because um, the next thing the policeman will do is to call in two of his colleagues who weigh about 150 pounds each, uh, or maybe 200 pounds, and they take the blood sample by force. And that's allowed, you're allowed to do that if you're suspected of uh, DUI in Sweden. So refusal doesn't really help you in the situation. They'll get the blood sample for toxicology anyway. So that's the pattern in Sweden from the roadside up to the, uh, the test at the laboratory. I want to mention uh, something which I have written about, as uh, Ron Jackson mentioned, this notion of uncertainty in a chemical test. And I would be the first to admit there is uncertainty. There are errors that can creep into a chemical test. But I think if you have a per se law, in other words, with a razor sharp difference in penalty, above the limit, you're guilty, Below the limit, no charges. If you have that kind of legislation, you really need to consider uncertainty in the methods you use to enforce that law. And uh, as this example shows you here, use the red alcohol scale from 0 to 0 0.2, uh, 0.081, that's grounds for being prosecuted for DUI if the statute says 0 0.08. If the result comes back 0 0.075, 0 0.079, 
that's below the limit. A quintal, no charges. But in terms of pharmacology, there's no difference between those two numbers. Something with a point 0.085 is just as dangerous or, or, or safe as someone with a point 0.075. So I don't think that um, a jury would convict uh, when they know that in that test you're making there is an error or there is uncertainty. And I've written about that in uh, many of my articles. And putting the words, measurement error is inherent in all methods of analysis. Simply because it is impossible to repeat exactly the sequence of events necessary to make the measurements. You can allow for measurement error or uncertainty by making a deduction from the average result of analysis, thus compensating for an inherent uncertainty. And I'll show you how we do that in Sweden. And again, uh, another basic uh, assumption is that uh, if you're using a chemical technical method to, uh, to uh, get evidence for prosecution, a person is not punished for a crime because of error or uncertainty in the methods and procedures used. The degree of uncertainty is very important when the result is close to some reference point or threshold value. And when a decision is made, as to whether or not the result was above or below the limit. I'm, I'm referring to the 0.08. Uh, in this state, it used to be 0.10. In Europe, it's mainly 0.05 uh, in those countries. And to bolster this argument about uh, uncertainty, you can quote from the famous uh, Dalbert decision in the Supreme Court. These are the so-called four criteria in that uh, judgment. Uh, and I, I like to talk about the importance of peer review, but also um, this uh, third one here is very important regarding uncertainty or error rate. And uh, five years ago or something, I pointed this out to my friend uh, from um, above the head, who's sitting in the back there. I said, I said why don't you um, uh, demand that the prosecution in these cases that you were uh, defending, why don't you demand that uh, they allow for uncertainty? And he said, well, look, that's Yankee law. I come from Georgia. But I think there's not a case law out there now where they're really demanding that an allowance is made for this uncertainty. And even the prosecution experts, I think, will have to admit there is uncertainty, and this is well, well, well illustrated in this slide. I know PowerPoints are used quite a bit these days in, uh, in, trial, in jury trials, and this is a very good example. Let's say you lined up five instruments, five breath analyzers, whichever one you want to choose, and the suspect, the DUI suspect, he blew in all five of them in rapid succession. These are numbers you could get. 0 0.075, 0 0.080, 0 0.090, 0 0.075, 0 0.085. Is this man above or below 0 0.08? And ask, ask the jury that. And they'll say, well, if he blew in uh, this instrument, he's above 0 0.08, he's 0 0.09. But if he blew in this instrument, he's below 0 0.08. Would you convict that person? I wouldn't, not without uh, an allowance for uncertainty. They're all within 0.02, and that's the criteria used when you blow twice into the same instrument. This is guys blowing the five instruments, all of the same manufacture, all calibrated in the same way, but you're getting five different numbers. And why do they differ, these numbers? Any idea why these numbers differ? Volume duration. Right, it's a biological factor here. Maybe he's exhaling for a different length of time in this instrument compared with this instrument. There's also inherent instrument differences. The calibration of the instruments is not exact. So there is uncertainty in these measurements. And with the per se law, this uncertainty needs to be considered. And how do you, how do you, how do you, consider, how do you allow for it then? What, what uh, mechanisms can we envisage to allow for uncertainty? Well, uh, in many states, they say, yeah, but we truncate the third decimal. 
but the third decimal could be a zero or a nine. So the guy with a zero as the third decimal doesn't get much benefit from that. We have a way we put the lowest of two tests. We've done a duplicate test. We take the lower of the two. But that doesn't help much if you get the same number twice, <coughs> which is possible these days. You can make a deduction from the average of two tests. And this is the method I recommend. Making an upfront deduction from the average of two test results, whether it's a two breath test results or whether it's two, two blood test results. It's also important to remember uncertainty increases as the concentration increases. You probably know some states, maybe even in this state, they have a two-tier or a sliding scale, penalty scale. The penalty can be more severe at higher concentrations. You may lose your license for three years as opposed to one year. So that needs to be considered when you're calculating uncertainty. And how we do it in Sweden is shown here. This is a typical printout, if you like, of a Swedish DUI uh, uh, strip from the instrument, but translated into English. So the guy is blown twice. He blew a point 095, <coughs> then three minutes later, actually now it's six minutes. We've extended the, the time to to six minutes. He blew a point 095. So the best estimate of the average alcohol level in his breath is the average of these two, 0.090. Because of the uncertainty I've spoken about, we make a 15% deduction. And let's print it out on the form. Deduction, 15% of that, 0.013. Prosecution, BRAC, 0.077. And if they want to, they can truncate the third decimal. So in this uh, state, that person wouldn't be prosecuted for a DUI not based on this evidence anyway, because after the deduction is made, he is uh, below the legal limit. And you can say that his result is at least 0.077 with 99.9% .9 confidence. So that's my recommendation to deal with this notion of uncertainty. It's to upfront admit it, calculate, where it, calculate the size of it, and, and deduct it. I think we've sidestepped a lot of unnecessary challenges by admitting this uncertainty up front. Because when you have a DUI law, which is per se, and which is based on a chemical test, I think the individual and society have the right to demand that this test has high precision, that means repeatability, reproducibility, high accuracy, high selectivity for what you're analyzing, in this case, case ethanol, and a high degree of quality control over the whole system of chemical testing. These terms uh, are useful to define sometimes. Ask maybe the um, prosecution expert if he knows what accuracy means. I'll bet you that many of them confuse accuracy with precision. Precision means agreement of replicated tests. Nothing to do with accuracy. Accuracy means closeness to the true value or the target value. And many people, even toxicologists, tend to confuse these two terms. Some other examples of what's uh, uh, debated and discussed in the court cases. And I'm going to focus a little bit on one issue which just cropped up in the last few weeks to do with interfering substances. The technology we have today for uh, breath testing for alcohol is quite sophisticated, to say the least. I mean, in the days of the breathalyzer, and I guess you remember this instrument, the chemical ampoule, the, the, the yellow uh, chemical in the tube, it's now obsolete, but that served well for many, many years. Then came gas chromatography, wasn't very practical, for use by police officers, so that never really survived. Then came uh, semiconductors, not specific for alcohol, they didn't survive. And then came infrared devices, which, are, which we have today. 5,000 as an example, and now the 8,000. Data Master also uses infrared, used in some states. The alcohol sensor, the alcohol meter, and the alcohol test, they're electrochemistry or fuel cell. 
And the example I want to show you later deals with that method of measuring. It's a combi unit out there. Combines both electrochemistry and infrared. Made by Drager, Alpha Test 7110, Mark IV. The intoxilizer people, the CMI, they've gone now from 5,000 to 8,000. But I wonder why. What motivated them to make that move? Of course, they didn't increase the price of the unit, I suppose, by $1,000. But was there a reason? Was there a solid scientific reason to make that uh, change from the 5,000, which was a, a three filter, actually a four filter, around by 3.4 microns, to a, a two uh, filter instrument at 3.4 or 9.5? They argue, I guess, it's because of interfering substances. But no science, they never published any science to motivate this change. I don't believe that there could be an interfering substance that gives you a 0.08 masquerading as ethanol. But the likelihood of it being partly interferent and partly alcohol, that's another story. I can give you several examples of an interferon, a 0.02, together with a 0.07, ethanol gives you a 0.09. So there's a much bigger probability of, of an interferon not being detected in the breath along with alcohol. What threshold uh, these instruments set at? They say our instrument can detect acetone, our instrument can detect isopropanol. Our instrument can detect toluene, but what threshold values of toluene, of acetone, isopropanol, they don't tell you. That needs to be uh, asked of them, and how it flags for these interference. Let's say what's in the breath then. Let's say what's in the breath of a healthy person these days. Well, it's going to be a lot of oxygen, nitrogen, inert gases. So they have no infrared absorption band, so they are important. <coughs> Carbon dioxide is there, that, that uh, absorbs infrared. Water vapor is there, but they are at the wrong wavelengths. And there's a lot of other stuff in the breath. Endogenous volatiles, so the primary ones are acetone, which you may smell sometimes on the breath of uh, a diabetic who hasn't been taking insulin properly, or someone on a ketogenic diet, the Atkins diet is an example. Isoprene is there in the breath. And there could be many pollutants in the environment. Many people work with organic solvents. They could be inhaled and then exhaled in the breath. But some of the criteria to uh, be classified as an interferent is it must be a gas or a vapor at normal body temperature and pressure. Otherwise, it's, it's a no-no from the beginning as an interferent. It must be present in the breath at a high enough concentration to make a difference. They give you a signal on the instrument. I, I mentioned isoprene uh, on the last slide. That will interfere with an infrared analyzer, but the concentration of the breath is too small to make a difference. And the infrared spectra of the interferent must match that of ethanol at the critical wavelengths. So there's not much really that. Uh, fulfills this criteria. But looking at endogenous compounds, these are things that the body produces during normal metabolism. The number one is going to be acetone. There's ammonia in the breath. Methane is in the breath. And especially in some people who have problems with digestion of carbohydrates, they produce methane. Acid aldehyde is there. That's the metabolite of ethanol. But again, my research has shown that the concentration is very, very low. The exogenous substances depends on the occupational exposure limits for various uh, workplaces. Many people use protective equipment. It's a law to use protective equipment like a face mask. People who abuse solvents, of course, they sniff all kinds of material. There's a good paper out there you should read. I give the citation here. That's short for Journal of Animal Toxicology, JAT. 2004. They tested 589 people, that's a lot of people, who came to hospital for emergency treatment. And they tested what was in the breath of these people. 
And the main finding was acetone, carbon monoxide that these people smoked. So carbon monoxide was there. So worth, worth, it's worth getting that article. This is the case that just dropped up a week or so ago. So this is in your hand. This, you don't all recognize this. There's a couple of examples outside here. These are the alcohol emission interlock devices. And these are being fitted now in Sweden to uh, public transport vehicles like buses and trains and other public transport vehicles. Even private cars, uh, they're being installed in. You get a lower insurance if you have one of these in your, in your car. So some people are, are, are working at that. So this uh, guy was going to stop his bus, he was a bus driver. And he blew into the uh, interlock and it uh, said uh, whatever it says. Uh, he couldn't start it, it started to, to red, red lights started to uh, blink or whatever. And he couldn't start the bus. So he, he went to the his supervisor and said, I couldn't start the bus. Who said, have you uh, been drinking? He said, no, I haven't. I, I've been a, a, a teetotaler for 40 years. Anyway, they didn't believe him, of course. And um, he was uh, sent home from his uh, work and the trade unions were involved and they were discussing whether to fire the guy uh, for breaking this um, rule they have about uh, having to uh, have a pass on this before you can start the vehicle. Because the threshold is set very low. It's set around about a 0.02 uh, grams per cent. So he uh, turned to his physician, or a physician at a hospital in Stockholm, because he'd been on a ketogenic diet during this time. And uh, this is based on electrochemistry. You got a positive result, a he was alleged ketopola, but he used a ketogenic diet and suffered from ketosis, which means ketones in the blood. And among these ketones is acetone. And uh, the physician couldn't explain why this instrument uh, gave a signal for, for, for acetone. And it doesn't, because acetone doesn't give a signal on this instrument. But isopropanol does. And uh, this same technology is used in the alpha sensor, the alpha test, and the intoximeter ECIR. They all use this electrochemistry. So they all will give a signal for 2-propanol, or isopropanol. And the mechanism is shown on this slide. <coughs> One consequence of eating low-carbohydrate diets is that um, you have to have calories, and uh, the body breaks down fat. And fat goes through a process called lipolysis, the free fatty acids. And they convert it in turn by ketosis into ketone body. And one of these is acetone, the others are things called beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. Acetone is then either leaves in the breath, with the urine, it can be oxidized. This is a very slow process. So when, they, when there's excess acetone in the blood, it can even be reduced to isopropanol. So this goes in two directions, either backwards to isopropanol or forwards to hydroxymetabolite. So the reason that guy got a positive signal on his um, alcohol ignition interlock was because in his blood, besides acetone, there was a significant amount of isopropanol. And that's important, I think. When I uh, testified on his behalf, I explained this to the, his employees uh, in the south of Sweden, they reinstated him immediately. So be wary of that. Acetone itself doesn't give a signal on electrochemical instruments, but its metabolite, isopropanol, does. Now you can easily get a 0.02 isopropanol if you're on a ketogenic diet. Unfortunately, that came up quite recently, so um, I haven't uh, uh, time to bring it to hand up. But we should remember that people are different uh, in the way they look, in their size, in the amount of fat, and uh, this biological variation needs to be considered uh, when we deal with uh, expert testimony in drug and alcohol related cases. Not only in what happens to alcohol in the body, but even in the way they are. And this old lady, she could never blow into a, a PBT or an evidential test. 
Uh, as you probably know, there's an enormous increase in number of um, refusals or failures to provide breath. This is a breakdown from a, a 2005 article on, on the internet from the AHPSA in, in uh, Washington showing a state-wise breakdown in refusal rates for evidential breath testing. In California, apparently, uh, you're, the, the people are very kind now to you. They willingly provide a uh, breath test. Uh, but in uh, Rhode Island, 80% uh, don't. Whether this is a refusal, that is, you say, no, I'm not going to blow. I hate all cops. I don't blow this instrument. That's to me is a refusal. But if the person attempts to provide a sample and is unable to do that, that's, I define, a failure to provide. There's a big difference there between an outright refusal and a failure to provide. And in Sweden, we find that some people just cannot possibly provide a sample. This is some data from the Intoxilizer 5000 as a function of age of the individual and gender. So the light bars are women and the black bars are men from this age group up to the 50s to 60 age group. And you see women in this age group, about 30% failed to provide a sample in the intoxilizer 5000. There's not only an age bias, there's even a gender bias. And this will help these people because uh, they got a blood sample instead. But there certainly are people out there who honestly just cannot provide a sample in this modern day evidential equipment. And this is published in one of our articles in 96. Uh, people with lung diseases, they just have no chance of being able to provide a sample. Whether it's asthma, uh, which is widespread, or even uh, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary COPD, they need to use these salbutamol sprays, and whether these inhalers might contain alcohol is one challenge that has been uh, raised from time to time. They just cannot uh, have enough uh, force by the capacity to satisfy the pressure, the time, and the, uh, the duration of the exhalation. In the intoxilizer 5000, you have to blow for <coughs> at least six seconds continuously with a certain flow rate to trigger the uh, instrument. Uh, and people with this uh, lung diseases, they just cannot uh, provide a proper sample. And um, as you know, Dr. Mike Hallestal has uh, written and uh, lectured a lot about uh, these problems with uh, the exchange of gases in the upper airways. His theory is the alcohol in its entirety is coming from the upper airways and not down from the alveola parts of the lung. He feels that that um, more or less invalidates the use of breath testing for alcohol. This is an interesting graph from a, a person with asthma. Uh, you know, you know, we're measuring two things here. On this scale, we're measuring breath alcohol. This is the breath alcohol graph. On this scale, we're measuring flow rate in liters per second. So this asthmatic there's a woman actually. She could only uh, reach a high enough flow rate for about one second, and then it dropped down to a low flow rate, and she couldn't provide a sample. Where alcohol level, the alcohol was there. Here's the plateau of alcohol in this lady. About 0.02 in our units, milligram per liter. Uh, actually, it's not point. It's not point two in your units. It's uh, a fraction of that. But uh, the important thing here is to see that her lung characteristics couldn't uh, fulfill the sampling requirements. You never really reach a plateau when you blow continuously into a breath analyzer. So the longer you blow, the higher the reading is going to be, it's going to be in the end. But after the first two or three seconds, you reach about 80% of the final value. So even a very bad breath test gives you a good idea of that person's alveolar alcohol concentration. So blowing for 10 seconds doesn't increase the alcohol concentration much more. The first two seconds are the most important. These are examples of curves um, with mouth alcohol. 
because the mouth alcohol detectors on these instruments uh, are not good. They may be good if you uh, swirl up whiskey in your mouth and then blow afterwards. They look like mouth alcohol. If you swirl whiskey in your mouth, then wait uh, five or six minutes and then blow the instrument. Although you have mouth alcohol, the instrument doesn't flag it as mouth alcohol. So these mouth alcohol detectors, uh, the algorithms in them are not uh, the best. They're not doing the uh, job they're designed to do. This is an example of what it could look like with a lot of mouth alcohol. There's no mouth alcohol in this individual. And the same individual at 10 minutes and 8.5 minutes after drinking or washing the mouth with whiskey, then you have uh, a wavy curve. It's easy to pick up these as mouth alcohol. But this isn't so easy. It's another individual now. He doesn't have these kind of wavy curves. These are his alcohol curves. They look perfect, but it's 10 minutes after uh, having whiskey in the mouth. So whether that would be flagged as mouth alcohol, I don't think it would. Here's no mouth alcohol here, because it takes about 15 minutes for mouth alcohol to disappear. So slow detect this then on uh, the majority of these instruments that I've tested anyway. They aren't uh, doing the job they're intended to do. But when the, um, when the uh, state people test this uh, slope detector, they either spray their throats with some alcohol, and then blow immediately the instrument, they, it flags not alcohol. Or they put some alcohol in their mouth, uh, sp uh, spit it out, and then blow the instrument. And then they'll flag not alcohol. But that's not the dangerous not the dangerous not alcohol is the alcohol that comes up from the stomach during a good attack. That's the dangerous mouth alcohol. That's what the instrument should be detecting. But unfortunately, it doesn't. So we need to do some more experiments, I think, to see how fast alcohol, after you ingest it, how fast it disappears from the stomach. Uh, this uh, ability of not to, uh, this, this failure to provide a sample <coughs> is causing a disturbance in New Jersey they replaced their breathalyzer 900 with this instrument. And after that, uh, a large number of people just failed to give a proper sample. So there's going to be a big hearing before a judge in New Jersey to see what's going on there. Because uh, it seems to me something has gone wrong there, that there's so many people suddenly failing to provide a sample when they changed instruments. Here's an experiment we did with that same alcohol test device. And this is a uh, the, the person consumes some alcohol uh, up to about a quite a low level, 0.03, and he took whiskey in his mouth, and swirled whiskey in his mouth, and then uh, spat it out. And every uh, 90 seconds, uh, it blew again into the uh, breath analyzer. It, it, uh, it flagged mouth alcohol, uh, mouth alcohol, mouth alcohol, but then it said, Nothing. It said it accepted the breath from this individual at that time. It's pretty obvious, I think. It's mouth alcohol there. But the instrument isn't seeing it. It's not flagging it as mouth alcohol. So that's the dangerous mouth alcohol. Then after another half an hour or so, they washed out the mouth with 6.5% alcohol and blew the instrument every 90 seconds. None of them were detected as uh, mouth alcohol. The instrument accepted all of them. Into two chocolate liqueurs in the mouth, chocolate and alcohol in, and the instrument didn't pick up these either as not alcohol. So I think it's a good example that, that even on one of the most modern instruments we have there today, the Alcohol Test 7110, it's not picking up the dangerous not alcohol. Other issues that uh, I've re re researched on over the years uh, about uh, forensic alcohol work is the, um, the pharmacokinetics of alcohol. And, uh, some of the things we're interested in is the, um, the rise in the BAC after the last drink, before the peak is reached. The uh, time taken to reach the peak after the last drink and the burn off rate, the slope of that declining phase. Those three things are very important in forensic alcohol litigation. 
putting a, a figure on the, uh, the time of reaching the maximum is very, very difficult. It could vary from 5 minutes to 150 minutes, depending on the individual, depending on his drinking, and depending primarily on how his stomach functions, uh, so-called gastric emptying. So many factors impinge on this absorption rate. Speed of drinking, time of day in the morning, you absorb faster than the evening. Blood glucose uh, influences absorption rate. A low blood glucose, you absorb faster. You have high blood glucose. Uh, liquor is absorbed faster than beer. Beer contains carbohydrates, but it's also a weaker a kind of alcohol. CO2 content plays a role. Buffer capacity of wines and food, particularly, is very important. That delays stomach emptying and gives you a long outdrawn peak, up to maybe two hours or two and a half hours before you peak. Medication you take may uh, influence gastric emptying. Simple drugs like Zantac, Tagamet, they could influence stomach emptying and time to reach peak. This is an example of an experiment we did. Uh, three men, all about the same weight, uh, 80 kilograms, about 170 pounds. He drank um, about six ounces of whiskey in, in, a, in an hour and um, tested him at uh, this time, and he blew a 0.052. And I could see Honey that he was a, a little bit euphoric. I could see he had a drink. He wasn't uh, in any way under the influence, but uh, you could see he was happy and he was, he was talkative. Alcohol is having its desired effects <coughs> on the individual. This individual the same. Same amount of whiskey, a little bit lighter weight, same drinking time. He blew a 0.049, pretty close to this one. And he also, you could see he was uh, euphoric and talkative and, uh, and happy. This other guy, same amount of whiskey, a little bit heavier, he only blew a 0.011. How could he ever predict that he would blow a 0.01 wine? Totally impossible. And you, could, you couldn't see anything on him. There was no idea he'd be drinking. He himself couldn't feel the effects of alcohol. So he has had, in my opinion, what I call a pyloric spasm. This pyloric sphincter, which is a muscle that controls the stomach emptying, has been closed off. So for this person, the absorption is taking place through the stomach and not through the duodenum. That's where the absorption is faster. In these two people, the alcohol has gone out into the duodenum and the small intestine. And in the individual case, you can never predict if someone is going to have a pyloric spasm. So be very, very wary about predicting when you're going to reach a peak uh, on the alcohol curve after drinking. People normally say that about 20% of the alcohol you drink is um, absorbed from the stomach and 80% from the duodenum or the jejunum and the small intestine. But there's no experiments out there uh, to verify these numbers. A lot of stuff in the literature is there, but there's no real evidential backing in peer-reviewed journals. And even in peer-reviewed journals, don't believe everything you read, because junk science has a tendency to escape the peer reviewers. Let's say you gave the same person alcohol on 10 occasions. Would you expect to find the same burn-off rate on those 10 occasions? Maybe naively you'd say, yes, you would, it's the same person. Why should you have a different burn-off rate? This experiment has been done, and you didn't get, we didn't get the uh, same burn-off rate. Or I didn't do the experiment, but it was done by some other pretty reliable people. And here's the example that they showed. A man who was 23 years old, he drank 40 grams of alcohol. I can't give you that ounces just now, but uh, in five minutes, on an empty stomach. And they looked at the shape of the curve starting 100 minutes later. So his average burn-off rate was 0.0157, which is the one we, we've learned from Widmark, 0.015. But the range in those 10 tests was 0.014 to 0.020. So this, um, <coughs> that kind of ballpark, even in the same individual. In the different individuals, there'll be a much bigger range, of course. 
How about uh, the other important um, Widmark factor? We talk about the beta factor, the burn off rate. The other factor, you know what that's called? The other Widmark factor? The rho factor? I wonder what rho factor these people have. I mean, Widmark said the rho factor for men was something like uh, 0.68. Today, people normally use about use 0.70. And for women, Widmark said it was 0.55. But today, many people use 0.60. Would that woman have a, a, a row factor of uh, 0.60 or 0.55? I don't think so. Would that man have a row factor of 0.7? Very muscular. Muscles contain a lot of water. Alcohol is likely to be diluted in the water. So my hunch is that this guy maybe have a, has a row of uh, uh, 0.8 or 0.85. I've never tested that kind of muscular individual, but my hunch would be that kind of ballpark. <clears throat> this lady's row, my hunch would be, would be probably closer to 0.45 than 0.55. Why is that? Well, you can see she's going to have a, uh, she's going to have kids diet or something. <laughs> a gastric bypass, uh, that she's pretty obese, and the fat doesn't dissolve alcohol. This guy, well, he doesn't have a driving license, I guess, so who cares what he's doing? And this old lady, uh, uh, doubtful if she'd be able to drive that age, or with that level of infirmity. He may have also an abnormal uh, row factor. So we have to be really very careful when we use a row factor in court to calculate someone's uh, expected BAC. And I'll give you a good example of that now. Remember Widmark's work was done back in the 30s. We didn't have McDonald's then, did we? Was McDonald's in the 30s? No. Kentucky Fried Chicken in the 30s? No. And all the other fast food places. They might, they might have been in uh, this country, but they certainly weren't in Sweden in the 30s. They only worked with 10 women and 20 men. There's not many people. This is a study we've just done, and uh, also is pretty new. I was curious to know what um, the row factor might be in obese people. So we had a, a man who was not obese. And how do you measure obesity? We use something called body mass index. And I'll get back to that shortly. Uh, this man had a body mass index of point of 19. He's a little bit underweight, actually, for his height. Because body mass index is a ratio between body weight in kilograms divided by height in the meters squared. Height times height, if you like. This woman had a body mass index of 32. She was obese. We gave the alcohol intravenously to avoid problems with gastric emptying and first pass metabolism. She had a roll of 0.45. The bill of rate was normal, 0.015, but the row was 0.45. If she'd been grossly obese, with a body mass index at like 35, <coughs> even 38, I wonder what the row factor would be then. We don't know, that's never been done. This guy had a slow burn off rate, 0.011, but a pretty normal row factor, 0.70. So I just got some, based on this preliminary study, I got some research funding to look at the uh, row factors in obesity. And funnily enough, this never been done before after all these years. I couldn't find a published article dealing with row factors in obesity, despite the problem that obesity causes today for ill health and um, longevity. Uh, use a little formula. Again, this isn't in the handout, unfortunately. But use the formula for calculating the body mass index when you jot this down. It's simply the body weight in kilograms divided by the height in meters squared. If you're above 25, you're overweight. I know you don't work with kilograms, you don't even work with meters, but you work with pounds, and you work with inches. So we use this formula. You plug in the formula, your body weight in pounds, multiplied by 0.45. You plug in your height in inches, multiplied by 0.0254. Do the same thing again and take this month by them together, you get body mass index. And you can play around with this and see what your own body mass index. And if it's uh, in these ranges, 
uh, your ideal weight for height is from 20 to about 25, uh, to between 25 and 29 or 30, you're overweight, and I'm actually overweight for my height uh, when I plug my own numbers in this equation. And if you're above 30, as this woman was, you're clinically obese. If you're above 40, you're morbidly obese, and the only thing really then is to have a gastric bypass. So that's the formula for body mass index. And why not, next time you have a client uh, who you're defending, plug in uh, his um, dimensions into that formula and see if you can argue in court for a lower row factor if the issue happens to be uh, what blood alcohol you get after one or two beers or, or whatever. Uh, so some examples to show you how the, the, the C-max C-max is the highest concentration reached, and the T-max is the time the C-max. How that can vary. This is a big experiment with 48 men uh, who all drank whiskey on an empty stomach. Notice the uh, C-max varied from about uh, in your units 0.13 to a uh, 0.06. Two-fold difference in C-max. The T-max was from something like 5 minutes or 10 minutes up to um, 120 minutes. That's a 12 times, uh, that's a, um, a 12 times difference in uh, T-max. And how could I predict that before doing an experiment? You just can't. And that's why I think you have to, in a, in a, in a criminal trial, when a beyond a reasonable doubt is the, is the criterion, you have to allow for this kind of variability that you see in these kind of experiments. And just don't give an average burn off rate, an average uh, row factor, an average uh, time to maximum. You have to allow for variability and then let the court decide uh, what uh, they want to believe. Again, other examples of the same amount of alcohol, a small dose, 0.3 gram per kilogram, on an empty stomach. 60 minutes after eating a breakfast, and then 60 minutes after breakfast and taking an aspirin, a drug we introduced as well. The uh, lines here is for each individual. Here they're pretty close, an empty stomach. But look at the variability when you introduce food in the stomach. And the drink was one hour after breakfast. So variability, variability, variability. Don't forget it. Uh, I never ever really try to get engaged in making forward predictions about what BAC I'd expect three hours after someone's drunk a certain amount of alcohol. You know nothing about first pass metabolism. Have you heard that term before? First pass metabolism, it means um, the breakdown of alcohol during the first passage of the blood uh, through the stomach and uh, through the liver. So some of the alcohol can be broken down in a first pass effect. And if you can reduce the amount of alcohol by up to 20% if you drink alcohol after food. Uh, I don't even like getting engaged in retrograde. If you only have one blood sample or one breath sample, you never know where you are on the alcohol curve. So how do you know if it's going up or going down when that sample was drawn? If you have two samples going down, you can say that, okay, he's going down between those two time points. But you don't know where he was going before this one was taken. Could it be going up? So two samples don't help in that respect. Yeah. So retrograde is, a, in my opinion, a dub dubious practice, and I avoid it uh, whenever possible. So don't get engaged in retrogrades. We looked uh, a couple of years ago at the burn-off rate of alcohol in drunk drivers. It was based on double blood samples. We came up with an average number of 0.019. You may say, well, why it's, why it's higher? Why is it higher than 0.015? The Widmark was talking about it. He didn't work with drunk drivers. It's higher in drunk drivers because many of these are alcoholic. So they have more rapid burn-off rates. So they bring up the average from 0.015 in moderate drinkers to 0.019 in drunk drivers. 
But I don't use that number in retrograde. I use a range. And the range would be 0.009 to 0.029. That would cover, I think, the vast majority of people in that population. <coughs> These are showing times to reach um, peak alcohol level after drinking. And many people peak early. But some peak late. And you never know if your client's a late peaker or an early peaker. You have to allow for variations. Another example of time to peak. <coughs> Again, uh, varies. Some people peak early, 30 minutes, 60 minutes. But some people peak late, 90 minutes, 120 minutes. Breath testing is probably being used today more often than blood testing. And the main advantage is it's not invasive. You don't have to get a doctor or a nurse to stick a needle in someone. And the police seem to like evidential breath testing. But they're also using something called um, graded penalties. Uh, if you have uh, 0.20, but you have to ask them, is the method linear over that range? The calibration control is at one point, normally 0.08. How do you know it's linear at 0.16 or 0.26? There has to be proof, in my opinion, that the device they're using is linear if they're using graded penalties. And they also have to make a big deduction if the alcohol concentration is bigger, as I said in the beginning. Blood breath ratio, forget it, it's a moving target. Could be almost anything. Uh, it's arbitrarily defined. Uh, we've always had the blood limit, 0.08. Uh, this is the assumed uh, breath blood ratio. So if you divide this out, you end up with 0.08 grams per 10 liters. So it's in the statute, if you like, when you define the, the, the threshold level in these units. I'm going to say something about um, other drugs before I finish. This is the main defense challenge in Sweden. Alleged drinking alcohol after driving. We've got the hip flask defense. And the onus of proof here is on the prosecution. So someone say, yeah, I crashed the car, but I'm so upset, so uh, nervous, I had to take a drink after I crashed the car. And the, the prosecution then must uh, disprove that. Other drugs than alcohol, as I say, has been, become one of, my main, um, one of my main interests in the last few years because we have a zero tolerance for, uh, for uh, prescribed drugs in Sweden and many other states. Uh, in this country going in that, in that direction. We have to distinguish between social drugs, coffee, nicotine, and alcohol, the illicit drugs listed here, and even the prescription drugs, which are also very dangerous and can impair performance and driving skills. These are some of the most common ones that you, you, you know about. Uh, ecstasy and cannabis, in some countries they're more liberal. Uh, they may want to be moved over to social drugs, but I don't think it'll happen in Sweden and probably not here. In Holland, they're more liberal with cannabis use. You can buy cannabis almost anywhere. Uh, I read a lot, read a lot of um, medical journals, and uh, they spend a fortune in, um, in publicizing their drugs. This is one in JAMA recently I saw. Do you know what drug they're advertising? You got it. These are something you should get if you don't have them. There's a website here. Uh, it's not clear on the slide. www.walshgroup.org. If you go into this website, you can download these two reports. They're worth getting hold of. This one deals with DUID laws in different parts of this country. And this deals with the feasibility of per se DUID laws. That's going to be the future, I think, for drug, drug driving. But www.walshgroup.org. This is being paid for by your taxes, so you can just download these uh, reports. And I understand 14 states now have some kind of um, per se EU ID law. These are the countries in Europe that have per se ID, EU ID laws. Uh, Sweden even includes scheduled medicinal drugs, and so does Poland. But most of the other countries only include the illicit drugs. 
These are the scheduling that's used in Sweden. The Schedule 1, these are the drugs that have no real medical, um, uh, valid medical application, like LSD, mescaline, marijuana, I think that's, that's, that's debatable, I guess, today. Uh, designer drugs like ecstasy. Group 2 is the uh, drugs which are dependence producing but have a minimal medical application, like amphetamine for narcolepsy or attention deficit uh, disorders. Group 3 are the strong analgesics like propoxyphene and uh, codeine. And group 4 are the um, sedatives like uh, benzodiazepines. And there are also group 5 drugs, but I can't uh, give you some names of those off the top of my head. I saw this in a Swedish newspaper in the last few weeks. Narcot uh, narcotics are legal in Mexico. Apparently, in Mexico, you can legally use um, narcotic drugs and then maybe drive back home with a positive uh, carboxy TOC in your urine. Drugs stay around a lot, a lot different from alcohol. These are some numbers, it's in the handout. How long can you detect drugs in urine? A lot longer than in blood. And for some drugs, like THC, up to several weeks after one use of marijuana. So these are in the handout. Depends on lipid solubility of the substance. THC is very lipid soluble, and the half life of the substance. These are some of the typical uh, scheduled drugs that we see in traffic cases in Sweden. Uh, so we need to learn a lot more about uh, these other drugs. This is a simple blood plasma distribution of alcohol, 1.15. You know what this is for diazepam? What the blood plasma distribution is? 1.8. Not 1.15. There's much more diazepam in the plasma than there is in the whole blood. And that needs to be considered when you're interpreting whether someone is uh, within some kind of threshold uh, level for a prescription drug. Zero concentrations, they don't exist. When we talk about zero concentration, we're talking about this term, LOQ, limit of quantitation. That's the minimum amount you can measure in a blood sample with analytical certainty. And that is the threshold le limit when you enforce a zero tolerance for other drugs. So there's always going to be some of it there, but it's not above that LQ. So that becomes the threshold limit. But it's not written in the law, it's in the, in the laboratory notebooks. Their LQ must be stated for each substance they analyze. Don't fall into the trap of accepting a screening uh, test as an evidential test. Everything starts with screening, an immunoassay screening, only a presumptive test of a drug. Presumptive means it could be there, it could not be there. You have to verify every screening result using much more sophisticated technology such as uh, GCMS or LCMS or, or GCNPD or GCFID detectors on your gastromantograph. So don't accept a positive immunoassay screening as proof that some have been using an illicit drug. Always ask for the verification. These are the main drugs we see in the Swedish DUI cases. A lot of them are poly drug users. Uh, and uh, here's an example of a poly drug user, a woman. She had no ethanol. She has a small amount of amphetamine, some fe fe another kind of uh, stimulant in the blood, some THC in the blood, she's been smoking marijuana or cannabis. She has some morphine in the blood, some codeine in the blood, six or seven morphine in the urine, that means she'd be taking heroin, morphine in the urine, codeine in the urine, days of them in the blood, and no days of them in the blood. Big, big concentrations. What did the doctor find? Slightly unavailable to the stimulant or depressant drug. With all that in her system, she must have an enormous tolerance for those drugs. So urine only proves that you've been using a banned substance. It doesn't say anything whatsoever about under the influence or impairment. Don't forget that. Recidivism is enormous in the DUID case in Sweden. Within four years, 50% of them are taken again for the same DUID. 
some of them many times, up to 12, 13, 14 times, if we take the new ID. There's a lot of issues I think left. We have to I'll just quickly go through these. You've got them in a handout. Tolerance development is quite different for these drugs but they with alcohol, poly drug use, immune assays are only screening tests, not verification. Metabolites are not active pharmacologically in many cases. Uh, the time of last test, the last use of the drug cannot be defined precisely from the, from the blood concentration. And they can be excreted in the urine for days or weeks after the last use of the drug, particularly amphetamine and carboxy THC. Some prescription drugs may be metabolized to amphetamine or methamphetamine in the body. That could give you a positive screening for amphetamine or methamphetamine <coughs> if you took a medicinal drug. The duplicates we talk about in breath testing or blood testing for alcohol, but do you get duplicates for other drugs? Ask the question, was that drug measured in duplicate? Any uncertainty allowed for other drugs? No, no uncertainty allowed here. What's the concentration of the drug in the therapeutic range for that substance? I mentioned the plasma blood distribution ratios. We don't know what they are for most drugs. We know, we know what it is for alcohol. How about stability? Little known. Reanalyze the sample after one month and see if you can find any zopic clone in the blood sample. It won't be there. So thanks for listening and I hope you have some good luck for your endeavors. That formula, uh, by the way, that I showed you uh, was uh, a big uh, drug uh, which we see a lot now in the traffic in Sweden, Zolpidem or Ambien. It's uh, really a very potent uh, hypnotic uh, to sleep at night, but if you take it the wrong time of the day, or overuse it, you're going to be a big danger in the traffic. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Mark. Wayne, could you comment briefly about uh, dry gas accuracy checks with uh, uh, fuel cell devices as compared to using wet bath simulators? The, well, the, the standard has always been and the, the gold standard. The question was that to comment on the use of dry gas simulators and wet simulators uh, in breath testing? Well, the, the, the gold standard has always been the wet bath because it's wet, your, your breath, you're measuring out with the breath, and the breath is saturated with water vapor. So you have a standard which, is, which mimics, if you like, your biological sample, breath as opposed to wet bath simulator. But the, 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 the dry uh, tubes, the dry gas tubes, there's no water vapor in those. They're also very sensitive for, for altitude variations. So the altitude can influence the number you get on the um, instrument. That has to be considered uh, when you look at the target value on the dry gas. Uh, I think that uh, what these uh, dry gases are used for uh, primarily is, I think the, the primary calibration is done still today by wet bath. But dry gases are being used to control the, cal cal the calibration in the field. Uh, I prefer, I mean old fashioned, but I still prefer the, the wet bath simulator because as I say, it's the closest you can come to mimicking the human breath. That's what I have on that. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you. Yeah, he'll be around, you can ask a question during the break. We're going to take 15 minutes to be back uh, at uh, well, 2.35. Thank you very much.